Ghost taping. Oh, yeah. Go stand over there so we can see you. You're supposed to be the leader and the guide 
uh, in natural things and in spiritual things, especially spiritual things. You're supposed to lead out. You're supposed to be that example. Amen? And you all are supposed to be one flesh. And so, as Jesus gave himself for us as the church, we, are, we all are supposed to be ready to give ourselves back for him. So, as we go into our service today, I just want to say, just like Jesus died for us, let us die for him. It's, I know it's not easy, but I praise God that every day the Lord gives me a new chance. He gives me a new grace, man, because I, 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 some days I need that grace. And I just want him to just have his way in my life and change me and mold me into what he desires me to be since he already laid his life down. Now it's time for me and for us to lay down ours. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you as we have this great, great, awesome day uh, as we start off worshiping you. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. If you all want to stand up, we're going to go ahead and do some worship.
share a little bit and then take communion together. So if you're at home, get your communion ready. If you're here, you haven't got it, you might want to run back here and grab it. Um, it's going to be real brief, but I, I want to share a little bit about um, a couple of the scriptures where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Uh, the first one is going to be in Matthew 23, 37, and following that will be real quick, Luke 19 and 41. Um, but really, the gist of what I'm going to talk, I mean, there's a lot that you can go over in this, but really what I want to point out is the missed opportunity of Jerusalem and that hour. And I thought it was really interesting that if you read before uh, the lament scripture of Jerusalem, is that pretty much the whole chapter is uh, Jesus rebu rebuking the leaders in the church, the scribes and the Pharisees. And really, he's, he's addressing it to the leaders, but the leaders represent the people. So it really is a broader picture of Jesus' rebuke to all of them. And what really caused Jesus this grief was the fact that um, the people chose the, the ways of the leaders over Jesus. And it really crushed his heart. And that's where you put yourself in verse 37 where Jesus laments over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Exclamation point, mind you. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he is greatly grieved because of the judgment that is coming to Jerusalem. And if you um, read like in 37, I mean, Jerusalem did not have a very good reputation at all. I mean, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, so over and over and over, God comes to us over and over. And here Jerusalem's reputation is not a very good one at all. So he laments. And then let's take it over to Luke 19. And after this account, we don't get the rebuke to the leaders, but in Luke, what happens after that is he goes and cleanses the temple. And Luke's perspective is more as um, there was the triumphal entry, and as he's drawing near to Jerusalem, um, from a distance he can see the city, and that's where it strikes his heart, and he gets grieved. And he says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And it's interesting, too, that Jerusalem actually means city of peace. So there's more going on with that, that um, sentence there. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And that's where it really got me. I'm like, oh yeah, this is what we need to talk about. It's the time of visitation. I'm not going to talk about the judgment and everything, but how God desires to visit his people. And how over and over and over again, he will continue to come and try to visit us. And the question is, will we let him? It's said in, in, in um, Matthew, but you would not let him. He, he desires to have us close to him and have that visitation, but we would not let him. And that grieves him. But this is what I really want to point out. And I was just praying this morning, like, Lord, there's got to be more to it than this. Give me something. Let, me, let, it, let it end on a high note, on a good note. Other than the fact that I know you come over and over and over. And the Lord said to me, Pentecost. See, that's what I think God's after today. See, I think we've missed opportunities. To me, that's what this is saying, is there's missed opportunities. Jerusalem had a missed opportunity. The very presence of God 
and they're missed. They missed it, and it, it caused him to weep. But he comes back. And where does the Holy Spirit come? But in Jerusalem, at Pentecost. I'm like, Lord, that's so powerful, powerful, that's so awesome. These people who refused to follow Jesus and instead chose to follow the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even cheering on for his death. Thousands get saved at Pentecost, and that was just the start of it. So, I want to pray today for us. And this has been visited throughout this year, this time of Pentecost that, that we're desiring, and, and, and I really do believe it's coming to each and every one of us. But I, I also want to underscore it with, you know, we do have the ability to refuse it too. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord God, for your continued grace. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that even though we refuse, Lord, you continue to come to us, Lord God, and give us another chance, Lord. I ask, Lord God, that you would show each and every one of us, Lord, where we have missed the opportunity for your visitation. Lord, you would be specific and show us. Lord, I ask that you would forgive us, Lord God. Lord, Forgive us for the past times we've missed, Lord God. And Lord, don't let us miss you again, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would continue to intercede for us, Lord God, and that we would have a visitation from you, Lord God, that would supersede any visitation we've ever had from you in the past, Lord God. Show us a new side of you, Lord God. Reveal yourself to us in a more powerful and a new and a fresh way, Lord God. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we've been doing as of late, I'm going to go to the Psalms. And many of us have been following the, a Psalm for the day that corresponds to the day of the year, and we've already obviously surpassed the 150th day of the year. We have 150 Psalms, so we've started over again. Yesterday would have been day 200 of the year. Today is 201 and of course, yesterday's psalm was 50, today's was 51, and uh, 51, of course, is David's great prayer of penitence, his great prayer of confessing of his sin, his great sin of, of committing adultery with Bathsheba, and basically contributing to the murder of, of Bathsheba's husband Uriah. You know, there is an interesting perspective. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Psalm 51, by the way, because we got to go through Psalm 50 to get to Psalm 51. And I really want to talk about Psalm 50 because, because yesterday for me and several of the members of our congregation, it was a powerful day. The Lord is, is so moving through, through these scriptures. But an interesting thing is when you um, check out the family uh, and living arrangements of David's family, there is a strong possibility uh, that Bathsheba, because of her relationship to the priests, was actually a young girl raised in David's home. That's heavy duty stuff in our hashtag Me Too reality. That ultimately David used his, his power, his kingship, his relationship with Bathsheba's family to uh, seduce this young woman. I mean, we're talking about serious serious sin and so as David admits to this serious sin and deals with it in Psalm 51 it's it's literally one of the most incredible passages for repentance and so again because that's kind of one of the words the Lord gave us for 2020 is repentance well we find ourselves there but but I want to go back to Psalm 50 we're in book two of the Psalms, as I said last week, and maybe some people didn't hear it. 
the Psalms are divided into five books and the five books of the Psalms correspond with the Torah, with the, with the Pentateuch, with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And we're in book two, which is the Exodus book. There, there are other ways to divide up those books, whether modern scholars divide them up or, or um, rabbinic Jews divide them up or ancient Jews divided them up. Uh, and so there are a lot of ways you can look at it, but what we do know is that the Psalms were put in the order they were put. It wasn't as just, oh, we got 150 of these Psalms, let's do pickup sticks. We'll just throw them up into the air or we'll draw them out of a, we'll draw them out of a, a, a TARDIS a collection box and we'll just put them in any old order. They're, they are they are put in specific order and um, book two started with Psalm 42 as I mentioned last week and Psalms 42 through 49 are Psalms of the sons of Korah Psalm 50 is a Psalm of Asaph and first of all looking at those who compose the Psalms the sons of Korah are, are a Levitical branch the uh, Asaph is a member uh, of a particular Levitical family. And so these are priestly families writing these psalms of worship. The sons of Korah, very interesting, their father was executed by the Lord for turning against Moses and turning against Aaron's God-ordained authority. God had placed Moses, Aaron, and Miriam in charge of the sons of Israel coming out of Egypt and coming into the land. And Korah, who was part of the same family as Moses and, and Aaron and Miriam, remember they were all Levites, perished in his rebellion. But yet his sons remained faithful. His sons remained faithful to the Lord even in the judgment of their father. And they organized those first Psalms of book two. Now remember how it went. Psalm 42 and 43 is an individual lament, an individual crying out to God, seeking after God, where is your presence, O Lord? Psalm 44 then was Psalm 44 was the nation crying out to the Lord. Where are you, God? We, we heard of the great deeds you did in the days of our fathers, but we want to see them now. And that, of course, is the psalm we taught out of last week. And that's very similar to us. Lord, we see what you did in the New Testament. We see it, Lord. We see what you did in the Old Testament. We see what you did with Moses and Elijah. And we saw what you did with the the, the original apostles and the, the ascension gift apostles. We see what you did, Lord. We've heard about these great, incredible revivals in church history. Can you move today, Lord, as you did then? That's, that's, that's what Teresa is saying. And even what Teresa is saying, there's a, there's a connection with Psalm 50 today. Then, then the 45th Psalm, it's a revelation of the king and his bride. It's as if the Lord has given us a pattern individually cry out to me corporately cry out to me and I'll reveal my king and I'll reveal his bride it's not just a revelation of the king but it's a revelation of the bride which again very consistent with what Pastor Bird spoke today he's talking about the, the, the husband and the wife the, the king and his bride and how we need to recognize that that's a mystery declaring who Christ in the church is. We need a revelation of the church. Do we understand the level of division that COVID-19, that the civil unrest, that the economic disruption has raised in the church? Do we know the level of division? And as I've said, it's not that those things created the division. The division was there but in these troubled circumstances, it's rising to the surface. We need a revelation of the church. We need to see the king, but do we understand 
that there's a revelation of the church because the church is the church because the church is the bride of Christ I am in unity with my brothers and sisters in Christ unity is not a kind of well yeah I'll work on it we, we're unified because there's a revelation of the church that just as Christ started the gospel kingdom purposes of the Lord the church is going to complete it what are we waiting for why are we waiting for the second coming why didn't Jesus just finish it all there I mean he died he rose from the dead he ascended to heaven why didn't he just finish things there what's the need of these 2,000 years since well that's because Jesus started it but man is going to finish it we're part of completing the gospel filling up that which is lacking of the sufferings of Christ Colossians 1 states that it's the apostolic imperative you know the book of Revelation is about Jesus but it's also about the church the book of Revelation is showing the church completes God's purposes so that's Psalm 45 then we get to Psalms uh, uh, 46 47 48 and we begin to see this this revelation of the God of the nations Israel cries out in Psalm 44 where are you God and then the, the king and his bride come forth in Psalm 45 and then 46 47 and 48 it's about Zion it's about God being the Lord of the nations it's about the Lord saying when I do rise up when I do rise up and answer the prayers of Psalm 44 this is what it's going to look like I'm going to thunder from Zion the place of my temple the place of my dwelling and again the temple and the place where God dwells the church is the temple but God is going to move in the nations through the church through his temple but he's going to be exalted high and high and lifted up and then all of a sudden for Psalm 49 we come in and Psalm 49 seems really out of place it's 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 like confusion it's it's in spite of all the words that God says God's people say we're poor we're suffering we're broken the wealthy those with power they excel in the earth what's wrong with this picture and the Lord says nothing's wrong with this picture it do, it has nothing to do with an outward manifestation of power of wealth of influence that's foolishness to view it that way because God is going to have the final say and he has the final say with every human being in death the Lord says so the Lord just says the wisdom the final psalm the wisdom psalm Psalm 49, the final psalm by the sons of Korah at this point is, just remember God has the final say, and that's the wisdom that's to guide us through this process. So now all of a sudden Asaph comes up. Now here's what you need to understand about Asaph. He was a Levite. He was a priest. He was a writer of hymns that end up in the Psalter, in the, in, among the Psalms, but he was prophetic. He is a prophetic worship leader and what's interesting about Psalm 50 is the majority of it is a prophecy it's God speaking in the first person I will do this I want this to happen I me God is speaking through Asaph and as as one commentator said well this should be not really this doesn't fit in the Psalms there should be a prophetic book it should be one of the prophetic books Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Joel, Asaph. But it's not. There, there, there are no prophetic books of Asaph. But there's a prophetic psalm. And it's placed here as if to say, now here is how God is going to carry out this purposes in the earth. God is going to show us now what he's going to do in our midst a day of visitation it's about a day of visitation it's a prophecy about when God comes down from heaven not on Mount Sinai but on Mount Zion this time and God appears and when he appears remember in the Old Testament 
When, when, when the Lord appears to a prophet, he commissions that prophet. And see, those Old Testament appearances of Yahweh to a prophet corresponds to the New Testament prophecy of Jesus, the apostolic revelation of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. There's a correspondence here. We're just looking at it from an Old Covenant perspective. This is all about the Lord coming in the midst of his people. And he's not just appearing to the prophet. He's appearing to all of his people. So we look at Psalm 50, verse 1. Reading out of the, my newly discovered John Calvin, Martin Luther translation of ESV. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Now what's going to be very interesting, that in the Hebrew, those are three different names for God. There are, there are five names for God. All the major names for God that are used in the Old Testament are in this psalm. So God appears and speaks to his people in every name by which he's named in the Old Covenant Scriptures. It says in the Hebrew here, El Elohim Yahweh speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Eloah and El Elyon will be other names of the Lord revealed at different places. And God refers to himself in all these names, five names. And, and it, it speaks of the, the different ways in which God reveals himself to the peoples of the earth. Each name corresponds to an aspect of revelation. And so as I, I encouraged my leaders yesterday and intercessors to read this psalm, I said, there are five names of God. Who knows how he's going to appear to you? He appeared to me one way yesterday, one name, and I understood and I said, and he may appear to us in different ways, but but we come together as the church. And again, instead of seeing a different aspect of the Lord and it being something that causes division, we bring those together and we see the fullness of Christ. See, here's what is so perplexing about the division in the body of Christ right now. It's a division based on truth, not on falsehood. And those are the hardest divisions to overcome. It's like sectarianism I've tried to teach that to our church so often sectarianism means I see a certain aspect of the truth and I act like that's the only aspect of the truth there is and I say well my aspect of the truth trumps your aspect of the truth and the foolishness and the difficulty of that is that you can't argue with each other by saying, well, what you're saying is not the truth. See, division that's based on truth and falsehood is easy to deal with. Well, that's wrong. You're saying Jesus was created? <laughs> that's wrong. You're, you're, you're saying Jesus is only one way to God? Well, you're wrong. But when you have one aspect of the truth and I have one aspect of the truth, how do you deal with that division? You have to have a vision, a vision of the Lord that reminds you that your understanding of the Lord is only part. You have to have a vision of the Lord that's so big that it allows other brothers and sisters who have a different but true vision of the Lord access to the work of God. So these three names, El is the God of creation. It's the God who's created the entire universe. Elohim is the God of all peoples, all nations. He's the God of the entire earth. And Yahweh is his special name. That's the name whereby he revealed himself to his people. That's the name, the only name given the only name given under heaven whereby a man might be saved. Yahweh is the old covenant counterpart to Jesus, Yeshua. So we see the God of creation. We see the God of the whole earth 
And we see the God of Israel. And there's a reason why it starts with those three. He is speaking and summoning the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. What he is doing, he's summoning everyone into the courtroom of the Lord. Very similar to Daniel 7 here, what's going on. The Ancient of Days, El, Elohim, Yahweh, is summoning, first of all, the entire earth from the rising of its sun to its setting for a single day. God is going to stop the world for a day. And he says, we're, we're, we're going to have a we're going to have a courtroom in action here, and I want the whole world to stop and see. See what I do and listen to me. Now, what's very important is right at the start of this psalm, God is going to speak. He's not just going to act. He's going to speak. And that's significant because what we're going to see throughout this psalm is God has been silent. We need to have a theology of God's silence. We'll see it emerge through here. But he, it's the rising of the sun to its setting. It's an entire day this is going to take place. Now, the Hebrew understanding of things, remember Malachi says, the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. That's the S-U-N of righteousness, not the S-O-N. We know that Jesus is the sun, S-O-N of God. But he's also the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. Hebrew orientation begins in the east. Every, everything, everything, it, wrong direction, east. The orientation of a Hebrew day starts when the sun rises from the east. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Now where he is calling, first of all, he's called the entire earth to come for this day when he stops the world to Zion. That's the place of his presence. That's the place of his people. That's the perfection of beauty. That's the place from which he shines forth. And again, if we understand Zion and temple and we understand their significance for the New Testament, it's the church. It's the people of God. That's where God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. God's going to speak. God's been silent, but he's going to speak. Before him is a devouring fire and around him a mighty tempest. And he's coming and as the Lord's theophanies. You see, this is an appearance of God. This is God himself, like coming down on Mount Sinai. Jesus appearing to the disciples after he's raised from the dead. Jesus appearing to Paul after he ascended to heaven. Jesus appearing to John in Revelation 1. That's a theophany. God is appearing. It's not just a word or a presence or a sense of God or even an inner vision. This is God himself appearing. But he's going to speak. And he he's disrupts you know, human reality with fire and, and tempestuous storm. Now he's called the world. Now he calls the heavens above and the earth. He calls to them that he may judge his people. He's going to make a judicial pronouncement, a judicial decision about his people. So here's the courtroom setting. The world is there. The heavens are there. The earth is there. And he's going to call his people there in a moment. The Lord is there. We've got a courtroom situation. The judgment of God. And we need to understand correctly what the judgment of God is. Bringing everybody there. And, and the language of heaven and earth appearing, that's uh, in Deuteronomy a lot. When we talk about covenant kinds of situation, God calls the heavens, God calls the earth to come and witness his decisions about his people. This is based on those, all those psalms of Korah, Lord. You're, what, what are you going to do, Lord? And Asaph prophesies it. Now, this also, because it was a psalm, it becomes a reading. It becomes a reading, a hymn, a liturgy put into the Psalter. So this, whereas this may have been a singular event, it now becomes something that is repeated and rehearsed. And remember, this is the way the psalms worked. The priest would recite part of the psalm, the people would respond back. And antiphonal 
response. And actually they would have sung it. Many of these psalms are, are, are obviously songs. But there's an interesting thing. In certain psalms, the priest speaks, the people respond, but in this psalm, a prophet would rise up and then be give, give the assembly of people a prophetic word. So the first four verses, it's probably the priest saying, and then all of a sudden the prophet Asaph stands up. Because the, the priest said, he calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And then the prophet gets up and says, gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And then the priest repeats again, the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judged. The prophet says, the priest says heaven, earth, all the world but the prophet summons God's people. And the faithful ones are the Hasids, those who are loyal to the covenant. A, a son of the covenant, a Hasid, a loyal one was one who kept the word of God, who kept the terms of the covenant, who lived out the covenant. So gather my faithful ones, and these are the ones who cut a covenant with me by their sacrifices. To cut a covenant, Genesis 15, when a covenant, when God made his covenant with Abraham, remember that he cut the animals into pieces and he placed all the pieces in a row and then God walked through the middle of those pieces and, and made a covenant with Abraham. So he wants those to be Hasids, to gather. He wants all of his people to respond to the visitation. He wants all of his people to be obedient. He wants all of his people to be in right covenant relationship with him. And verse 6 says, The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. So this is about the righteousness of the Lord. The Hasids are those who embrace the righteousness and justice of the Lord. And now the prophet speaks, because watch the first person. This is God speaking. He says, hear, O my people, I will speak. It's the Lord speaking. O Israel, I will testify against you. Now, what this is, this, this summoning them to this covenant gathering, it is a covenant renewal. At the great feasts, when the, when the sons of Israel came up three times a year before the Lord, those were oftentimes covenant renewal services. You'd, you'd, God, God and his people were in a covenant, but they would renew it and they would recite the word of God to renew it. They would recite the Torah to renew it at special feasts. And, and more than likely, when, when you look at the language in this psalm, this was probably, um, I believe it's Deuteronomy 31, 10 and 11. That's what I seem to remember. You don't have to turn to it, but this is more than likely a covenant renewal service on Sukkoth, the Feast of the Tabernacles, the ingathering, the final feast of the year, the ingathering. And remember, Passover starts everything. That was the barley harvest. Then Pentecost was the wheat harvest 50 days later, and then in the, the autumn, you had the, the feast of the ingathering where all the other crops, the olive oil, the, the, the grapes, all those other crops were brought in. Tabernacles is the final ingathering and always pictures the conclusion of God's purposes in the earth. Passover starts God's purposes, were ransomed from Egypt. Pentecost continues, he appears on Mount Sinai and gives them the law or he pours out his spirit and Jesus dies, that's Passover and Pentecost. So the, the feast of the ingathering is when the, the nations of the earth submitted to God within the context of his lordship over Israel. And that of course corresponds to the, the wedding supper of the lamb. The bride has made herself ready. Hear all my people and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. It is covenant renewal done in the context of a covenant lawsuit. There's going to be actual testimony here. God's going to give testimony. 
He's, it's interesting. He he's, gives testimony. He's the judge. He's the king. And he's the sentencing officer. <laughs> he's everything. In God's courtroom, you don't need a whole bunch of different civil servants. God's, God's, God's everything in there. So this is about actual legal issues. Now, legal issues would be covenant issues. And you're going to see that when we get to the final section of this psalm, the Lord is... Uh, the first section which we read up to verse 6 gathering his people this next section is going to be a definition of the terms of this this covenant renewal but it's also going to be a picture on what real worship what real sacrifice is all about and then the Lord's going to deal with the issues but the things he's going to bear witness against his people are the ten commandments everything he says corresponds to one of the commandments here Hear my people, I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. And now we have Eloah. The fourth term whereby he's called. And this is the living God. Eloah is the God who is alive. And he's the God who is near. He's not the God far away in heaven because he just, he just came down to earth for this for this judicial setting I am God your God I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices your burnt offerings are continually before me now understand what the Lord is saying here when God comes into the midst of his people he does something he tells us what we're doing right and he tells us what we're doing wrong that's the seven churches in Revelation this is a counterpart to the prophecy to the seven churches in the New Testament. We have the Old Testament prophet Asaph speaking for the Lord. Now here's something very interesting. Sacrifices, burnt offerings, represent worship. The Lord says, I have no problem with your worship. You're worshiping, you're doing it all right, keep worshiping. Now, there's a theology of worship here. Never judge a church by its worship. When I, when I hear somebody say, well, I, I'm going to this church. Well, why, you know, why are you going to this church? Oh, I love the worship there. Do, do you know that's a mistake to make? And here's the reason why. Their worship is fine, but you're going to see a lot of other things aren't fine with them. You cannot judge a church by its worship. When the church is worshiping the Lord, it doesn't matter what their lives outside that worship are like. It doesn't matter what their doctrine is like. When they're worshiping the Lord, God is powerfully in their midst. Do you know, and I'm not naming churches, there are churches, their worship is spectacular. They have spectacular worship, and in fact, they, they play their worship all around the world. When you listen to their teaching, it's nutty. It's crazy. It's, not, it's, it's barely biblical. It's full of falsehood. And yet, if you were to go in that church when they were worshiping, you would feel the presence of God because God inhabits the praises of his people. But the Lord wants to take his people beyond simply worship. See, worship, the, the reason worship is so pure is worship is for God. It belongs to God. It is his people giving him worship. And because it belongs to God, he comes where people are pouring out their hearts to him. He comes, and that's where his presence is. Remember, Asaph's a prophetic worship leader. He understands this. But then the Lord says, but, but let, let, let me make sure you understand the purpose of worship. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? 
Do you understand the concept of worship of the nation surrounding Israel was a flawed concept of worship because they had a flawed understanding of who God is. God was fed by worship. God had certain needs within him met by worship. Uh, the different animals that were sacrificed to, to the gods of, of the nation surrounding um, Israel all spoke of certain uh, perspectives on God. God needed this snake offered, or God needed this unclean animal offered, or God needed human sacrifice. We understand all those things. Were, and Yahweh's saying, no, that's not, that's not what my worship is all about. It's not about my needs. Don't frame me as, as a pagan God. When you do worship me, you need to understand who I really am. So here's what he contrasts as God's needs or God being appeased or, or, or God's hungry. He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. The God of Israel, first and foremost, Eloi, the living God, is a God in relationship with his people. The real point of worship is that I'm your God, you're my people, and we are in a relationship. And see, that's why worship works, regardless of people's doctrines or practices. Worship will always work. Because as long as the understanding is this is entering into a relationship with the living God and that's the primary source of your worship your worship is just fine and the Lord is saying your worship's fine but he actually speaks of four things here. he doesn't just want one thing he wants four things offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving worship rooted in relationship from a heart of thanksgiving. The thanksgiving offering was thanking God for not only what he did, but for who he was. But the Lord says there's another thing. Perform your vows to the Most High. Be obedient. And here's the fifth name of God. Elion, the Most High. And that's the God who is above all the gods of the earth. And that's why he counters the false worship that false gods demand with Elion, the God who is over all, all the other gods of the earth. The Lord wants worship. The Lord wants obedience. Third, call upon me in the day of trouble. He wants us to cry out to him to have our needs met. We don't need horses and chariots and money and political parties. and We don't need that. We cry out to God and then the Lord, the fourth thing he says, and I will deliver you, and you shall bring glory unto me. So the Lord is, this is the covenant lawsuit. Your worship's fine, but we need obedience. We need to recognize that you alone are our source of life. We cry out to you and none other. And when you cry out to God, you cry out expecting to have an answer. You, have, you cry out expecting God to move. You cry out in hope. You cry out in faith. You meet somebody to minister to them. What's going on with you? I've lost hope. I don't believe anymore. Well, I'll pray for you, but I, I, I can't pray you out of your situation if you don't cry out to the living God and expect to be answered. I'll pray that you get hope. I'll pray that you get faith. But I really can't pray for you to be delivered until you have hope and faith that you're crying out to the Lord in the day of trouble and expect to be answered. The Lord steps in and says, and the fourth point is, I'll deliver you and you will bring glory to me. The, when God delivers, when, when we walk in faith, when we walk in obedience, when we walk in worship, then the Lord responds with deliverance and he is glorified by answering our prayer, by summoning a faithful people, by receiving the praises of a thankful people. He's glorified, and when he's glorified, he does what? Releases his glory. 
So there's a four-step four pattern here. Then the Lord says something interesting because he summoned all his people. The, he's called them all chassids, all covenant sons and daughters, loyal and faithful to God. He said, all of them have cut a covenant with me. But now all of a sudden, but to the wicked, God says, to the lawless, God says. This, this word in Hebrew has to do with those who do not keep the law. Those who are not obedient. And he, he's, he, he's, he's speaking to his people because this is in the context of the covenant he's made with all his people. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? Now, now here's the issue that God has with his people. First of all, those who recite his statutes are those who in their mind enumerate the statutes in the Word of God. In other words, they think about the Bible, they think about Scripture, they meditate on Scripture, they study Scripture, but that's all they do with Scripture. You take my covenant on your lips, they talk about God's Scripture, about His Word, but they don't do it. Now you see, we're, we're, the, the parallel here between the Hasids and the rashags in the Hebrew, the, the, the covenantly faithful versus the lawless or the rebellious, it's the same reality as we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount, he said, those who build on sand are those who hear my word but don't do it. Those who build the house upon the rock, they hear my word and they do it. That's the start of Matthew, Matthew 7. In Matthew 25, and remember, those were the wise were the ones who heard and did. The foolish were the ones who only heard but did not do. In Matthew 25, you have the wise and the foolish virgins. Some have oil in their lamps, some don't. The wise virgins are those who hear the word of God and do it. The foolish virgins are those who only hear the word but don't do it. The Lord's making the same kind of separation here. There are some of you that hear and do. There are some of you that do not do. You just hear. And the first clue that he gives is, for you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. The discipline is the discipline that's spoken of in Proverbs about instruction. Instruction in wisdom. Instruction in what foolishness is. Instruction in hearing the voice of your father. The instruction that Hebrews 12 says, my son, my daughters, don't faint when you're disciplined by the Lord. When you're chastened by the Lord. He does this. God sends discipline that is really instruction. God's disciplining hand is God's instruction. And it's just something he does in us. It's, we're, we're headed in the wrong direction. God says no. We're doing the wrong thing and our hand gets slapped. We're, we're, we're headed in the wrong direction and the Lord warns us. That's the discipline of the Lord. Discipline is never pleasant. Being told no is never pleasant. We live in a generation that refuses discipline and refuses instruction. For you hate discipline. He's giving you a clue who the lawless are. The very first thing that emerges in them is this dislike of discipline. They don't like to be told no. And it says, and you cast my words behind you. Literally, it means you cast my words behind your feet. It's kind of like trampling on the word of the Lord. And then the Lord goes into a series of images that come from the Ten Commandments. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him. You shall not steal. You keep company with adulterers. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You give your mouth free reign for evil. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Your tongue frames deceit. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbors. Now here's what's interesting. I, I read again Rabbi Hirsch's commentary, the Hebrew commentary, and I, I kind of trust Jewish commentators when they say this is what this word means or this is what the uh, 
semantic uh, sense of this is, and I can see I'm going a lot longer, it's already 12.08, uh, let's, let's close this down. It is not talking about here in the Hebrew people who themselves commit adultery or commit thievery or do these things. It's people who allow those things happening in the world to influence them. Well, you know what? Everybody's a thief. Everybody's an adulterer. Everybody speaks falsehood. Everybody speaks deceit. You can't really escape it. It's the, that cheap grace message that Bonhoeffer talks about that we kind of see in the body of Christ. It's this agreement with unrighteousness over righteousness. And it, it starts with we don't like instruction. We start taking wrong information from the sin around us. We use it to justify maybe our own lack of daysfulness. But it ends up with a critical spirit. People who refuse discipline end up with a critical spirit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Spirit of criticism. Always criticizing. Do you, do you know somebody who's always criticizing? It grates on you. It wears on you. Jesus called them Pharisees in the New Testament. So we close. These things you have done, the Lord says, and I have been silent. So we need a theology of silence. What is the theology of silence? The theology of silence is the Lord's silence does not mean the Lord's approval. See, a lot of people think, well, because God hasn't dealt with this thing in my life. That means he's okay with it. But God's silence is never a complete silence. His word is there before us. He's always speaking in his word. If I'm, if, well, I can't hear the voice of the Lord. Well, try opening up Genesis or Matthew or, or Second Chronicles or Lamentations or the Psalms or, or Galatians. <laughs> if you can't hear God's voice, God is speaking. How about sitting down with your brothers and sisters and listening to what your brothers and sisters say to you? But God is going to speak here. He's speaking prophetically. These things you have done and have been silent, and you thought that I was one like yourself. See, in silence, we think God's agreeing with us, and therefore we make God in our own image and likeness. And see, this is what God is dealing with when he comes in judgment. But now I rebuke you. I did, didn't rebuke you earlier for your worship, but I'm rebuking you for something else. And I'm laying a charge before you. I'm presenting the facts of the case. So then he closes. Mark this. Be mindful of this. Understand this then, you who forget God. And the essence of the Hebrew is you who ignore God lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. So it's ultimately, this is a warning for judgment. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. He says, continue to worship me. This is our way out. This is our way of escape when God judges. The one who offers worship glorifies me. And the one who orders his way rightly to this one, I will show the salvation of God. I will show my deliverance. Now I'm just going to close briefly with my, my reaction to all of this. This is what happened to me. The Lord woke me up at, at daybreak yesterday. Friday night was a very, very difficult night for me and my wife. We were just really being tried by God and as we were being tried by God, the fear of the Lord came over us. The fear of God came over us. It was a difficult evening. I was questioning many things in the presence of the Lord. As I prayed my final prayers going to sleep, a, a peace started to come over me, but I woke up at the crack of dawn and the Lord said well read your psalm for the day Psalm 50 and I actually went outdoors I saw the sunrise and I began Psalm 50 and Psalm 50 starts with the rising of the sun 
the Lord said, okay, I'm stopping everything for you today, son. I'm, I'm going to stop, and you're going to come into my presence. And as you come into my presence, I'm going to show you just what I'm going to do with my people and my church in this hour. I'm coming down, and I'm going to set things straight. And then I shared with you what, 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 what God shared with me. I, I read... I studied, I mean, I took out the Hebrew, I was looking up the Hebrew, I was praying into it, I was reading it in different translations, I was looking at different commentaries, rabbinic commentaries, I just, and this is what I said, and it's a summary of what happened to me. I was awakened at dawn to read and pray into this psalm for about three hours. The Lord spoke clearly, today is the day of his appearance and judgment to us, and I exhorted my leaders and intercessors be prepared and seek an encounter with him this is not just for us at Lord of the Harvest we are in a season of judgment for the whole people of God I mean the body of Christ this God has stopped the world okay we understand that as I saw the sought the Lord and this is this is eventually what happened to me I understood it was a theophany I said well are you gonna appear to me and I it wasn't happening because I was doing this for three hours and I kind of forgot about it and started praying and the Lord came and this is what I saw as I sought the Lord I saw myself standing with my arms and heart outstretched and under me was the Lord of the harvest those who are part of the church those who had left the church in the past those who are considering leaving. I also saw those who rendered countless accusations against this house, the leadership, the vision, but we were all one. It wasn't, well, here are the Hasids and here are the Rashads. It wasn't, here are the wise and here are the foolish. We were all one and I was just standing over everyone. And I cried out for the judgment of the Lord for all of us. No one was innocent. No one was guilty in my understanding. I don't, I, it was above my pay grade. I, I couldn't make that distinction. I cried out to the Lord to appear to all, to bring repentance to all, to heal all, to restore all. I could do nothing else. The rabbinic commentary on this psalm said the righteous ones, the Hasids, are those who embrace his discipline. And the only ones who do so are those who embrace the fear of the Lord. Do so in our midst, O oh God. I experienced the appearance of God this morning that I have awaited for years. I believe he's coming to all of you as well, whether today or tomorrow or in the coming days. He has answered me the question I have asked about the church for years. I've asked this question for over 20 years and the Lord showed up. I had a theophany. He showed up and he answered the question. He answered me the question I have asked about the church for years. You have come, mighty warrior. Are you for us or against us? Psalm 50 and his appearance has shown me. God has come for his people and he's not finished. He's not finished with anyone, whatever category people are in. I am undone, but whole at the same time. I would state later on it was the most powerful prophetic experience I've ever had in all my years in the Lord. And God did a great transformation for me and I, I could only describe it while I, while I was when I came out of this and I was trying to describe it I thought of the final scene of, of Ben-Hur the movie and this is how I described it Judah Ben-Hur was betrayed by his friend Masala he was betrayed he was his property was stolen he was put in prison his 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 mother and sister were exiled and his mother and sister because they were exiled, and it was all because of his friend Masala who turned against him. They became lepers. Judah Ben-Hur was driven by anger and vengeance because of it. Now, on several occasions in the movie, Judah Ben-Hur sees Jesus. 
He sees Jesus several times in his life, but in the concluding scene, he ends up at the cross witnessing Jesus' death. His, 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 his mother and sister, who are lepers, became followers of Jesus. And Judah, who's driven by this anger and this fear and this hatred and this vengeance, he's standing there and Jesus is dying and he hears the Lord cry out his final cry. And Judah says, when I heard him say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Those words, he removed the sword from my heart. In the movie, his mother and sister who were followers of Jesus in their leprosy were supernaturally healed in that same moment. This is what I experienced this morning. The Lord removed the sword from my heart. In his presence, he says, I'm coming. I'm coming in judgment. I'm coming as El. I'm coming as Elohim. I'm coming as Yahweh. I'm coming as Eloi. I'm coming as El Yon. I'm coming in the name of Jesus to my house. And the Lord is going to judge and everyone's going to be given a chance to get right with God. Lord, I took way too long this morning. i sorry. I got all caught up, but be with your people. Thank you for your revelation. I believe that I was impacted by the heart of God, even in the midst of your judgment. And Lord, you don't, you don't mince words in judgment. You call the, the, the covenantly faithful, covenantly faithful, and you call the lawless ones lawless. But when you come and judge, at the end, there's an opening for everyone to worship, for everyone to obey, for everyone to repent and get right. May it be done for us in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You're dismissed, brothers and sisters. God bless you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.